Hey, 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 what is going on, ROK Familia? It is your boy BN, aka Mr. Kingdom Builder, and today we are back again giving you some of that good, good in the hood information and education. Today we're going to be touching on being a leader. What does it actually take to be an alliance leader? What goes into it? How much time do you have to spend? What do you have to do? We're going to talk about everything and breaking it down one by one. There will also be title cards where you can find timestamps not only in the description, but on the lower bottom part of where the video bar is that you'll be able to fast forward or rewind uh, if you'd like. So the first, uh, before we get started, right, make sure you guys sub, like, ring the notification bell, and of course, if you want to join and be a part of our conversation, you can hit up our Discord, which you'll find in the pinned comment and description down below. First things up, let's talk about time commitment. So with time commitment, you're probably going to spend anywhere from a couple hours a day, upwards of 10, 12, 14, maybe 16 hours a day, right? A lot of it comes down to how successful is your alliance? Is it lasting long? Are you climbing the leaderboards? Do you have a successful kingdom? Right? Is your kingdom climbing the ranks? What's expectations in the kingdom? Right? Do you have to make it for meetings? Are you doing voice meetings? Are you writing up uh, mails for the kingdom? Are you just doing it for your alliance? I mean, again, th some things, and we're going to break these things down as well as we continue through the video, but just want you to be aware that these are things that are important and necessary uh, to have. Okay. So the next thing here is that we're going to be talking about going into announcement boards, right? So it is really important that when you're creating your alliance, right, you're going to go to alliance and then it'll say create or join. We're already in alliance, but we'll show you that process here at the end. You will click create. It's going to cost you 500 uh, red gems. And then you will be able to choose your symbol. You can choose your tag. You could choose your alliance name. Um, and then you'll be able to do your announcement board. You can do your settings as well, right? So do you want people, we can't look at this, but essentially if you want people to be able to uh, do invite only or you want to have your alliance open where that means anyone can join, invite only is where they apply and then you have to review the application. So these things are what you'll do as basics. When it comes to the announcement board though, I do think it's important because you want to make sure you have a good announcement board. And I'll give you a couple good tips here, which is one, I think it's important that when we're looking through everything, you have, for example, I think your alliance name is important, maybe not in the big font. One of the cool things is you can do custom font and text. You can Google that to find some information out on it. However, probably not this big. I do think it's important to have like a brief description on your alliance, maybe some expectations, maybe you have some kingdom rules here as well. Um, along with possibly some alliance rules, um, unless you just want to combine those and they apply to everyone. Then I think it's good for you to have some information such as, and usually at the top, it's good to have something like your kingdom discord if you have one, uh, your alliance discord if you have one. And then near the bottom, I think it's good for you to have, after kind of the description portions, have you know who your reps are in your alliance. Do you have roles already set for your officers? We'll touch on that a little bit later as well. And then what are and then who is the contact person right for each of these positions? I also think it's good for you to list their in-game name along with their Discord as well, just in case. Now let's talk about recruiting. Recruiting is something that is going to be very important for everyone to do because when you're recruiting you well first and foremost you need to be able to recruit if you want to obviously advance your alliance if you want to power up if you want to do tech if you want to get helps for players there's a lot of reasons why but some good tips for recruiting specifically is and this is usually what you're going to really find the majority of everyone doing when a kingdom first starts is that you're probably going to want to come up with some kind of a custom recruitment message. You'll post this in Kingdom Chat. And this is pretty much that's going to be flooded with this when a Kingdom first starts. But one of the ways you can do that, you can also take a look at the leaderboards. You can look at surrounding players that might not be in alliances, specifically ones that are within your province, or I should say your Zone 1 starting province. Uh, and so these are, again, just to name some of how you'll go about it. But the objective really is to try and recruit as many people as you can, as fast as you can, because you want to be maximizing on those helps and those tech donation cooldowns to start as soon as possible. And this kind of gets into the next segue here, which is going to be, uh, and, and again, you can also recruit out of Discord, right? If you have people that, if your kingdom just started and you're, you know, maybe new players are getting into the game. You can recruit outside of that, maybe for them to come and join that kingdom to start a brand new account. I mean, again, right, there, there's a few ways. 
However, now we'll segue into right, placing your first fortress. And why recruiting is also factored into that is because you need to get alliance credits, right? There's really two of three ways you could do this. You can do it off of donating tech, alliance helps, and then constructing buildings. Now, when you're just starting your alliance out, you don't have any buildings. So you have to build your fortress first because that's then how you're going to build your flags, which we'll segue here in a moment. And so you focus on tech donations and then alliance helps. And so this is something where you're basically going to have to wait until you get enough alliance credits for. You'll go here, territory, and then you'll see here we're center fortress, alliance fortress one, alliance fortress two, right? You're going to build the center fortress. And I'll just give you an example here, right? This is like how it is, how it looks, right? You can notice that the area for building a center fortress is actually bigger than building a flag. And I'll briefly show you that here, right? If I want to build a flag, you can see the area is smaller. Right, it's almost double, I guess, maybe exactly double, but just so you know the difference there in the space. Now, when you're looking to place your center fortress, <clears throat> you might ask yourself, well, boss, where do I put the center fortress? I will tell you where you put the center fortress. So, um, again, we're in zone one, which is if you look at the map in the top right hand corner, you'll notice zone one is your outer perimeter, zone two is your second tier middle perimeter, um, and then your very center of the map is zone three. So everyone starts off in zone one, and you're, once you get enough alliance credits and you're looking at places to build your center fortress, some of the good tips I think you should factor into is one, location and kind of centered proximity. What I mean by that is you want to consider placing a center fortress between objective points. That can be your altars, it can be the sanctums, right? Altars are the tall ones, sanctums are the smaller ones, and then... Uh, and then from here, you also want to consider your zone two gates and then potentially your zone one adjacent gates, right? Usually priorities kind of go to objectives, uh, sanctums and altars, right? And then zone two gates. Some people might start put their center fortress at the zone two gate and then build away from it. I am a little bit more of a fan of building centered, right? Not only between objectives, because if you're between objectives, it's a shorter amount of building flagging that you have to do to get to them. Then the fourth big thing you want to consider is RSS tiles or RSS deposits because you need RSS deposits if you want to be able, one, to continue building flags, be able to build more fortresses, and then also get gold from the tiles so you can research tech, right? So all of these things are extremely important to do. Now, when you're looking, like I said, for where you're going to place your center fortress, I like to not only factor all of these things in, but then also look for clusters, right are there any really really good clusters on the map where i can place a center fortress and get multiple rss tiles right so i think one that i would consider to be looking at would be somewhere like here right this would be one that comes to mind maybe up here if you want the gold the food right this could be okay as well uh, because this position right you're still decently centered and you actually get some gold from it uh, right so again you you have a couple options but for, well, for this example we'll just say you go here right now as we go here we'll zoom out just a bit because we want to be able to see what's around and now you can see the tiles right you'll see here a lion's stone deposit wood logging camp and you can see 2000 earning you can see 1500 earning right 1500 earning okay so now let's say i place my center fortress by not clicking on my items <laughs> we'll go to territory we'll click build and you can see it shows green now and it also shows as long as these as long as the border here is it has these rss deposit tiles within the moment that this finishes you will start getting that and it'll show in your alliance territory right up here oh excuse me where am i going now no not territory here we go it'll show right here right in your deposits Oops, hang on. Well, yes, right. So this this gives you the total. Hang on, there's another area that I go to. Here we go, storehouse. So if you click on storehouse, you can see, right, here's how much you're getting per hour, and then here's what your storehouse, like your maximums are. All right, so you can always go to storehouse and check this along with how many credits that you currently have as well. Okay, now let's talk about flagging. So flagging is very important. As you can see here, if you're looking at the flagging routes, which we'll show you by, oops, coming up here and looking at alliance is that 
Here you can see all the flags are exactly, for the most part, right two or full tiles away. One of the things you do not want to do, and I'll give you an example, is you want to make sure that when you're building a flag, you are, right, and you can see here, right, okay, so here's one. So it, look, if I go away, right, you'll see that I can't build it because I'm not connected. If I come here, I can build it because I'm connected. What you don't want to do is this, right, because remember, I have space that's right here. So I want to make sure that I'm building my flag at maximum distance. I don't want to do like a half distance. Now, there might be some situations where it may be okay to do that, right? And I'm not going to exclude it completely. But what I will say is that really only do it if you absolutely have to. You always want to try and get max distance on your flags uh, because it's just max coverage area, right? And you also want to consider that as you're flagging, any of the, any of the RSS gathering, like any of these gatherings, you will... Again, from gathering these tiles, right, your, our, your storehouse will get a percentage of this as well for whatever you gather if you finish gathering a node on top of, right, or within a line's territory, which means that it's on a flag or within the flag's territory. Uh, or excuse me, right, along with kind of getting the increased uh, gathering speed um, as well. So, so uh, again, these are just things that you get passively from just doing these things, right, when you're on territory. Let me see if it'll actually show us this flags, right? Bam, but must not be. No, it doesn't. See, that'd be really cool if it, if it gave me an explanation. Let me see if it does here. Info, view, reinforce. Ah, it doesn't. That would be really cool if it did. Sad life. Okay. With that being said, uh, let's move on to the next thing here, which is going to be... Uh, right, what's the order that you want to go in when you're flagging out, right? Because like we talked about, you have to make sure that you are getting enough resources. And we'll show you how much does it cost to build a flag. So right now you can see here it costs 375k credits, right? 1.9, uh, right? It's it's 1.9 food, 1.9 wood, stone, and then gold, right? So the ratios here you can kind of see, right? Gold from food and wood, it's kind of like two to one. And then here from this, it's like 1.7, 1.75. So my recommendation is kind of going like a 10, 10, 8, 6, right? So you go like 10 food, 10 wood, right? 7 or 8 stone, uh, and then probably 6. You could argue 5 gold, 5 to 6 gold, right? I think 7 to 8 stone, 5 to 6 gold is okay, um, like per every 10. However, usually in the beginning, you just want to try flagging out to your objective points, getting as many as you can. And then if you're able to consider doing some more specific checks, that's kind of how you want to eventually ratio it out, right? That would be my recommendation. And you can see that reiterated if we go to the storehouse for this alliance, they have 110, 112, right? So again, these are near the same, 87, 80, right? So that's kind of the rate that they're going at. All right, then next we're going to talk about markers. Markers is very important because markers are going to allow for you, and I'll give you an example here, right? So if I go to here to a marker, I don't know what this says. So here we go. So uh, corn, wood, gold, right? So that, that's that's how they're doing their granaries, right? So if I want to find out where a granary is to help you construct this, this is basically a big RSS deposit that allows for you to be safe so you can't be attacked on your regular ones, on regular ones like this. So again, uh, you see markers are being used not only for just special objectives or notifications. You can use markers, right, to tell people where to go. Do you want them? Do you want everyone to gather over here, right, near this fortress? Okay, cool. Um, do you, are we planning to do uh, guardians, for example, right? If I want to go to an altar saying many of the objectives, right? You can see here that if I click on this, you can see where it says guardian. If I click on it, it says shrine guardian, right? Depending on the thing, if it's a shrine, if it's an altar sanctum, right? It'll save the guardians for there, right? Maybe we're doing, maybe we're going to kill the guardians because just because they give you a lot of XP, and you also get some rune stones as well from them that you can use for kind of extra bonuses, right? It could be like buff attacks, it could be gathering, research building, things like that. You want to organize that. So you might say, hey, we're going to do this. We'll do guardians here at 12 UTC, right? So again, being able to do that along with using markers just efficiently uh, on the map can be really important, right? Maybe even when you're going to siege a gate. And again, you can kind of think outside the box there with how many uses that may have. Next is going to be a uh, tech path, right? Plus uh, cost of, uh, right? And we're going to talk about this, right? So if you're going to do tech, remember that doing tech costs alliance credits, right? That is something that is really important to bear in mind is that 
if you're going to upgrade tech, after you finish donating the tech, you have to have enough alliance credits on hand to actually start it. So let's take a look at tech, and I'm just going to give you a couple recommendations here on how to start. Right. First and foremost, I think development and territory is pretty much where you're going to do the majority of your uh, tech. Probably more so development than you are territory, but we're going to go over a couple things. So first and foremost, I think that if you're starting out, one of the mo one of the most important things is obviously increasing your member capacity because the, the higher member capacity you have, the more players you can get in the alliance. Therefore, you're getting more helps and more overall donations, along with possibly faster constructions or being able to just construct more often, right? Because you have more players on hand that uh, may be online at around a 24-hour period, let's say. So doing something like Great Alliance 1 is great. You're going to get plus 10 members for this after you research. Together we rise, I would say, is probably a good number two. And then you're going to go right into, I would say, doing city construction, right, to get that 8% building speed and then 8% for technology research, right? Then from this point, you really want to try and get to Great Alliance 2, right, because that's going to give you plus 30 members. This is really what you want to do, right? So you basically want to go Great Alliance 1, Great Alliance 2. Now, you can do some of these things I mentioned, right? Like I think maxing together we rise is great. Um, right, again, you're going to get, uh, again, it says here increases the speed up time of Alliance helps. And the speed up time is going to be plus 122nd, right? That's for each Alliance help that you're going to get. So again, these things do scale well once you start getting to higher help amounts, right? That kind of factors into your castle level. And so from here, this is kind of where you want to get. You can see just between Great Alliance 1 and 2, it's plus 40 member capacity. That's really good. Then eventually you're going to want to work on things like City Construction 2, Tech Research 2. You eventually want to work on things like Talented Commander, which is going to give you a plus 10% XP um, for when, you're, when your commander is out there, plus 15. This kid brings you to plus 25, right? These are really good, along with your gathering. But then you also want to work in your territory, right? Now you'll probably do this sometime between before you end up getting probably all of these done right like you'll probably do great alliance one together we rise you can come and do architecture which i think is good right this reduces the resources consumed to build flags i think that's really important then you could do something like city tech one or the other right i would say increased flag quantity is going to be really good even if you just do it once right uh, maybe one for storehouse right and you can kind of one and one these right like i think doing city construction tech but before you, because again, before you get to do Great Alliance 2, I think it will be good to keep in mind, right? You, again, you'll have to gauge it, right? How are you getting close to getting max on your resource storage? Okay, maybe we want to go and do a, a storehouse expansion tech. Do we, Are we getting close to having max flags? Okay, well, now we need to go and do a flag quantity. Don't just max these ones out. I do, however, think it's okay if you want to max out architecture just because it does reduce the overall cost of them. Uh, but usually it's okay to even do back and forth. You don't have to necessarily do things back to back, right? With the exception of like, you can do a city construction tech, go back and do the other one, um, right? Those are examples. Most of the time when you're doing something like Great Alliance 1, you start off with Great Alliance 1, you're doing Together We Rise, you come back to Great Alliance 1. Now you can also do something where you can save but usually you don't want to save tech. An example of that would be like, let's say Great Alliance 1 is research and you just tell everyone, hey, don't spend so that way you have max tech donations on Great Alliance 1. With the exception of people who are already at max tech, you would probably tell them to spend so they don't sit there at 24 out of 24, not gaining any new techs. Um, so again, I don't want to get into like the whole ma macro, uh, you know, advanced ways of doing things. However, um, this would be my recommendation on some of the priority techs that you want to hit and then others that you just need to kind of look at as need to research once those moments are coming up okay so that pretty much covers the beginning portion there next we're going to be talking about uh, officers right and kind of promoting officers how does that actually look so one of the things I'll, I'll, I'll say here is that some of the good things you want to look for in officers are one right do they socially engage in game right you can go off of this based on let's just give you an example if I can look at my alliance chat right are they socially engaged in the game? Are they helping players out? Not only are they talking, but are they answering questions, right? Are they giving good tips? Are they giving good information, uh, right? Do they show that maybe they've had experience before? This is kind of more optional, right? But if they are, that could be another thing to look at. 
These are a couple areas that you could use to identify potential officer candidates. Now, the important thing here to remember is that as you are going through this, right, you want to be sure that, uh, excuse me, going into like the next part is once you identify some of these individuals, reach out to them, ask them, you know, shoot them a message and say, you know, you can say something like, hey, uh, noticed, uh, saw you uh, helping out players today in chat and for the past few um, would you be interested in being an officer, right? Again, something simple like that. Um, you could type up and just ask people. Maybe you have players that come out already and they say things such as, well, okay, you know, I'm, I, I'd, or I'd like to be an officer, right? Maybe they come already to you or they mention it in chat and it's something that they're already interested in doing. Okay, well, you know, go ahead and, and ask them a couple questions. Hey, have you been an officer before? Um, right are uh, you know you know what are some areas that you can help out with uh, you know again have they never been an officer before maybe you just need to help them along a little bit by kind of giving them some things to do uh, right or maybe they already have done things before and you just kind of have a good starting point uh, but again those are some ways at least to identify officers to try and select then when it comes to roles for officers right there are some things that you're going to want to do there like we briefly alluded to early on you can do things such as having, like, for example, here, right? Let me click this, and it should switch. For You can see someone here, like, you have a diplomacy role, right? This is someone who would just mainly be the contact person for doing any kind of diplomacy, whether that's arranging territory allocation, if it is uh, working on who's going to take certain... Uh, excuse me, if it's, if it's working on who's going to take certain... Uh, structures, objectives, maybe you guys are working on merges potentially for diplomacy. Maybe you're trying to de-escalate war. Uh, maybe you're threatening someone to go to war, right? But having someone there in that position is great. Recruiting, right? This can be a good thing. This can be the person that you end up having coming to you uh, or the main contact person for people that might want to join the alliance. Maybe the lead recruiter is also someone who's going out there and proactively looking for people to try and get to join the alliance having like a war rep is an example right someone that can give you good pvp tips for players they can educate people answer questions they can maybe do some of your war prep planning right so if a war breaks out or if you guys have to find an alliance in your uh, province right maybe you just already kind of have some contingencies ready to go just in case right then you have your leader kind of your main contact person uh, maybe you have someone who organizes event events right maybe you have someone who does tech audits uh, right again kind of thinking outside the box just giving you a couple examples and then for the one thing i will say with officers is do not be afraid to identify or if you are noticing inactivity right do not be afraid to let people know you know hey it's a trial basis you know and obviously we'll kind of play it out if they're consistent and they show you that it's great i like to all i like to usually say that because it doesn't present any hard expectations or assumptions of work right if you tell people hey yeah i'd love to try you out right again we can try you out see how it fits is it a good fit for you a good fit for me right and when you do it like that that kind of removes the pressure kind of removes the seriousness of it and then you can really kind of gauge and see how they act and if it's something where you know maybe they come on and and hopefully the the least situ least amount of times that this may happen is you might have someone that comes on as an officer and they're just not doing anything uh, right or they're barely doing anything and, you know, at that time, you might be thinking to yourself, man, you know, this person just doesn't seem fit. And sometimes it can be good to reach out to them, see if they have something going on. And if not, and you just notice they're consistently not doing anything, don't be afraid to message this person and say, hey, look, um, you know, I just don't think it's working out right now. You know, it doesn't seem that there's a, it doesn't seem like there's a lot that you're doing or you're that engaged. Maybe you have a lot going on in real life, right? Maybe uh, just being an officer is more than maybe what you thought or considered it would be, and that's okay. Right. Um, again, I'll, I'm, I, I'm just going to demote you for now. But if a later time comes up that you'd like to try and be an officer again, and if that's the case, and let's say they give you that, yeah, I would like to be again. Right. Let's keep trying. Uh, allow a window of time. Right. For s some stuff to marinate <laughs> uh, before considering again. I just want to throw that out there as like an extra tip. OK, now let's get into like tech auditing. This is something I briefly touched on a little bit earlier. I'm going to probably tell you this is arguably going to be the single best point that I'm going to that I'm really going to dive into. And I'm going to do this as briefly as I can. I think it is absolutely without a doubt extremely important that you need to do tech audits. 
right? And I'll give you an example. If I click on a member and I click on info, right? I can go to, oh gosh, hang on, where am I going now? Where am I going now? Uh, I think it's stats, we'll go to more info, right? Oh gosh, where am I going here? Alliance helps, no, that's just help times. Oh gosh, maybe I'm just thinking of another game. I guess you can go off of helps too, but, oh, hang on, maybe it's the rankings. Let me see, settings, rankings. Alliance help. Oh, here it is. Mad scientist. I think this. Yeah, here we go. Right. So you would go to Mad Scientist, and you can see right tech donations. Alliance members can donate resources to help their alliance uh, research and intelligence members will make donations, uh, make their individual alliance credits. To some extent, alliance tech donations reflect how active members are, as well as their willingness to contribute and develop to tech. Right. So what you would do here is you would go through the board. Right for everyone here that has uh, that that donates to tech, right? And you can see every member of the alliance, right? Like, let me see here. It says it goes up to 120. Let's just confirm that's what we see as well, right? 120. So you would go through this on, I'd say every couple days. In the beginning is really important, maybe every two to three days, and you just put a spreadsheet together and you say, okay, hey, column, you basically just do a column for each day, right? Or for the days that you're doing the audit and you and you check, right? Because if you're gonna do donations, right? Remember, you can get up to 20 donations. Oh gosh, I think I might've said out of 24 before. Um, it's my fault, I was thinking, probably thinking of another Kingdom Builder that I would play as well. But for 20, right? So you got 20 donations you can do, that's your max that you can hit. Once you hit 20, you're not gonna generate any more donations. So it kind of, Again, alludes to you want to make sure to never really hit 20, right? You kind of always want to be 19 out of 20 or less, so that way you're not stuck not being able to do a donation, right? Which just means you're losing out on a donation overall. So the thing here is that if you check that, you can also see how many people are consistently donating, right? Um, and that's very, very, very important, right? You'll eventually find what the next chance is. I want to say it's about 30 minutes here for the recycle on this. Um, I could I could be wrong. I'm just averaging that. But uh, again, you'll, you'll figure out what it is. And let's just say it is 30 minutes, right? So that means that at 20 donations, right, it takes 10 hours. Like, let's just estimate, right? It'll take 10 hours to generate that many. Uh, and so even though maybe, maybe it's an hour, actually, I'm, I'm probably, but whatever it may be, whatever it is, even though I just can't remember what it is right now, you want to figure out the timing for that. And then you want to try and uh, find how many uh, donations can you do per day. You want to have that number down and then have maybe you times that by each of the days. And you can get an idea, an average gauge on, okay, well, when you check donations again two or three days later, this is the number, right? They should be plus 48 or plus 72, whatever the number is, right? And that will help you figure out who's consistently donating and who's not. Because again, if they're not donating, then you, you know, again, you can make an argument for removing that player and bringing someone in that will donate. Um, so anyway, I think doing tech audits is extremely important. Okay, next thing here is going to be males, right? I think males are really, really just as equally important because I think males is the way that we inform people, we educate them, we let them know what's going on, and males cannot be understated, right? It's an event's going on, you're trying to give tips, good information, you want to give redeem codes, you're trying to promote the Discord, whatever it may be. You want to give people state of affair updates on, on how the kingdom's going, right? Males are really important. Also, using some of like the custom HTML code, right? An example of this would be if you're sending that, we can't send any mails, right? Because it says rank one can. Um, and, and, but I will show you, I think we're at a point now where, well, actually, I'll, I'll briefly touch on that when we go to create the new alliance. But in short, when you're sending a mail out, let me see if I can give you an example here of a mail that has been sent. That actually might be a good one here. So we have some system stuff here. Person, okay, here. Here's an example of an alliance mail that was sent out a little while ago, about a month ago, uh, right, where you have a gift code. So you can see here, right, you have the person who sent it, you got the subject line, then you have the description. You can actually code some of this stuff by doing like the bracket B bracket, and then you have the, the text, and then you have the bracket, the slash, the B and bracket, that kind of gives you the bold, right? And I'll show you some of this as well um, about how you can do that, right, by kind of just testing. Actually, I can probably just show you right now in message, it doesn't have to be that intense. Okay, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to press and hold. We'll do select all, right? So it is an example. You could do B, B, hello world, B, right? And then if it sends this, it'll be in bold, 
right? So you can use some HTML code, which is pretty cool, and then also some custom text um, via HTML code that you can use in-game, right, when you're sending mails out. But it is just important that I think some good mails that you send out, right, or again, right, give people updates, send good information, let them know when events are coming up, right, explain to them how they can kind of min-max their accounts, uh, right, just keep them up to date. Because you have to also consider mails for most people is almost like getting their weekly magazine, right? That's their sole notice that they get on what is going on. And the last mail that you send, if it's any kind of an update, that's usually the last impression people get unless they're hearing things word of mouth. So it's really important to stay up to date on mails. Uh, my recommendation also is to format mails, right? Don't just give them the big wall of text. Format stuff, make it look pretty, make it look nice, because that's something that's also going to more engage and motivate players, especially if they get a good, well-written mail that isn't too long right for each of the points, however you end up doing it. The next thing uh, I'll briefly touch on with, uh, we'll actually come back to this on the mails thing, so let's talk about creating groups. I think creating groups is really important because you will have an opportunity to set up custom groups, right? And how you do this is by utilizing your friends list. So let's say I just go into Kingdom, I see a player here, right? Let's and I click add, right? I wait for them to accept, and then what I could do from here, right, is I could go into a group chat. Let me see if this will work here. So I'll go here, right? And okay, I can message this player now. If I click up here, right, after they accept, I can add people to this current chat and then it becomes, or this current chat and becomes a group chat that I can rename the group chat, right? So the kicker here is you gotta have people added first before you can make a group chat. But then you can add every single player in the Alliance. You can have a group chat for caves. You can have a group chat just for gift codes. You can have a group chat for sieges that you're gonna do next. Um, you can have a group chat just for updating, uh, for like a, for read-only chats, right? It could be a read-only on, hey, these are, these are the next two techs we're doing, or this is the tech we're focusing on, right? Once it maxes, then you can do this next tech, right? Uh, tech. You can think of it for uh, numerous reasons. But it is really important that you set up group chats and you add everyone to those. Uh, and then also, uh, correspondingly, right, you remove people that have left the alliance, right? Because uh, unfortunately, there's no like auto-remove feature, so you kind of have to do it manually. Next thing here is going to be uh, diplomacy. Now, we did talk about kind of setting up a diplomacy role, but I just want to briefly talk about some things that you're going to do as a diplomat, or just not necessarily as a diplomat, but just things to consider when you're doing diplomacy early on in the kingdom. So, again, everyone starts here in zone one. Once you kind of defog the area, it's good to reach out to any of the other alliance leaders there, even if, even if it is just to introduce yourself, just to establish communication, maybe start building a rapport, <clears throat> because you never know when you're going to reach out to them next. Maybe see if they have Discord, right? You can communicate on there. Maybe another preferred social media, unless you're okay doing it in-game. That's fine as well. But again, reaching out to other leaders in the area, so that way if you need to communicate on things, uh, right, or maybe talk about like, hey, is it okay if I flag here, right? Again, you know, these are things that you can have the conversations with because you've already introduced yourself. One pro tip I'll give you is you should never reach out to someone with an immediate request. Reach out and say hi, introduce, get some information, right? Maybe find out why they're there. Are they solo? Are they a part of a group, um, right? Just try and, again, have a little bit of a conversation right before you kind of get into, well, you know, okay, cool, right? Are you looking to go this way, looking to go that way? You can also, you know, gauge that on how big the alliance is, right? What's their power, right? If it's a smaller alliance and, you know, they're half or a third of the size as the other big alliances in the zone, but they're asking, but they're basically telling you like, hey, I want this zone to pass, that might make that may not make the most sense, right? They might be more, uh, right? It might be better maybe go for a zone one adjacent pass for them, or even just considering merging, right? So you kind of have to be able to appropriately assess the situation and how you're going to respond. Then let's talk about roles, right? So like R1 through R3 roles, right? What do those mean? What can you even do with those? So I'll give you an example here. If we look at members, you can see you got the officer roles, your rank threes, your rank twos, and rank ones. How I like to do it, and this is just a standard way until you kind of develop more of a, a detailed uh, approach, is that you can do rank one, right? So you can do rank one is for brand new members, people that you're waiting to like consistently donate, right? Showing you that they're here for, you know, more than just being a part of the alliance, right? They're active contributors. R2 could be, uh, right, or you can even just say R1 could be for new players or just active contributors that you're waiting to see. R2 could be for people that 
are actively contributing, they're constantly growing their power, and they're good to go, right? R3s could be for potential, like for example, they could be like for your potential rally leaders, maybe your top 20 or top 25 strongest players in the alliance. Uh, and then R4s, right, could be for, again, your specific officers, right? You can do a mix of this. I like to usually just have the officers here that are pure officers, um, right? And especially if you can have up to eight or however many, right, I think that can also help out as well. Um, again, this is just some examples on how you can do it. Uh, right again i'm sure you can figure out kind of variations as you go the last thing i'm going to touch on now is oh so let me do this let me leave the alliance i'm just going to show you kind of uh one of the one of the male portions that i really wanted to show off real quick so i'm going to leave i'm going to not join we're going to click create and then right you can see the tag here so i'm just going to just go through something right we'll just say hi hi oh it's already being used let's do hi z let's do hi z i Wow, hizzing tag is already being used. Interesting. Tag must be three to four Z T B S. Okay, there we go. Whatever. Z I don't know. Sounds good. Uh, okay, so then we'll put this in. And oh, I have to. Okay, cool. There we go. Uh, announcement. Hello. Right. You see here, anyone can join. You can set your English language. I like just to maybe go all languages just because of the translate. I don't think it's really a problem. But if you want, you can just do your preferred language. Uh, right. And then you can browse and you can kind of choose this. You can do your color palette. You know, again, whatever it may be. We'll click create alliance. Right. Don't it will expand. Yes. Confirm. I want to create. OK. So we have the alliance set up. Now let's go to males. So rough life. Upgrade your city hall. I have to be 10 to do a mail. OK. In that case, what I will just say that I was going to be able to do that when you're sending a mail out, there will also be a screen for you that you'll be able to see, which will be if you're looking to, uh, gosh, what is it? So it should be the 10 hour. It's kind of like the ready check here. And I'm actually going to show this to you guys. And you know what? Thankfully, I have some screenshots, which is super cool. Now, I don't know if any of these things have changed, but I will show you this on just essentially how does the actual mail look? And then what are some options that you're going to have there? So let me switch this up for you. Give me a moment here. And OK. So as we pull this up, we're going to switch over here. So I'll show you when you're sending a mail, right? This is what the mail looks like. And you can see at the bottom, there's like this send ready check. Now, the ready check I like because it's something that you can do to, to do polls, right? Like, let's say you want to do a poll and you're just trying to collect information, right? Maybe you want to find out how many people are going to be, how many people will be available for an upcoming siege, uh, right? How many people would like for us to do gold next or wood, right? Uh, right? Like, just things like this. And it lets you just choose a simple green check or a red X, right? So it's kind of a yes or no, or you can kind of be creative and have it be like two options. Then it looks like this where you'll see you'll get different options. Now, I don't know if these have been changed, but again, this is how long you basically want your poll, right, or your ready check response to, uh, to, to allow people to give their answers, right? Then from here, right, let me see, I had actually had one more here, yeah. So the next thing, last thing we're gonna talk about is doing um, like titles, right? So appointing officers, um, sorry, giving officers like an appointment title, right? And so you'll notice here that when you're looking at this, and shout out to uh, Dirk is Devil because I screenshotted this from our video just because I couldn't, I couldn't find it um, from doing it another way. Uh, so uh, here, and that's because I think you have to be a lead actually to actually to see these things. But you can see there's like a little plus sign here. When you click on the plus sign, it'll bring you here where you can kind of give officers certain titles. And you can see here like counselor, building, research speed, troop attack, troop health, right? Gathering speed plus, plus 10%. That's pretty good. And so you can do things where like you appoint these on a daily basis. You can do these where, hey, each of you guys will kind of get these for a week each. You rotate them however you see fit. But these are just things that you'll also consider doing uh, that will be available to you. All right. I think at this point now, that kind of brings me to my last thing. Where am I at? Oh my gosh, I'm almost at 40 minutes here. So the last thing I'm going to touch on is going to be what I think are just good characteristics, right, of being a lead in these types of games. I think it's really important that we, that as a leader of an alliance, right, you're cool, you're calm, you're collected, right, you, you give the benefit of the doubt, you leave no stone unturned, right, you get both sides of the story, uh, right, uh, I, again, you, you know, you have like this, kind of neutral tone approach that you take, right? I think 
right? Being flustered, impulsive, right? The, you know, again, remaining things like in being in, unbiased in situations and really kind of just looking at them as a whole, right? Being being the kind of beacon for your alliance um, is extremely important, right? Finding officers that can kind of be an extension of the lead, an extension of what the alliance's goals are, the standards are, um, the rules that they've set can be really important. And really being a problem solver, right? Being someone that um, is, again, customer support, your tech support, right? You're there to help members out as well. These are all good things that alliance leaders can, and, and in my opinion, I think should be, right? It's kind of just common denominators of, you know, what are, I think, good traits when it comes to not only how you can be a leader, but how others may view you as a leader. Okay. With that being said, that now rounds it out for me. I was not expecting for this video to be over 40 minutes, but it really just kind of shows you how much goes into being an alliance leader and everything that you have to do, what you have to consider, and kind of how you would start out. That's it for me. I would love to know what you guys think down below. Right? I'm sure I might have missed one or two things, but I definitely wanted to try and cover as much as I could. Let me know what you guys think on the video. Does this help you out if you're someone who's just getting into it? Maybe you've been leading alliances in a couple kingdoms, and after watching this, maybe you have a better understanding of just how much goes into it, all the different things that you have to consider and what you have to do. Uh, and again, I'd love to know your thoughts. That's it for me. Until next time, we will catch you later.